In the last 10 days, 11,000 migrants have arrived on the small Italian island of Lampedusa. On the southern border of the United States, 9,000 are crossing every day. The United States immigration courts currently have a backlog of 2.6 million cases, of which 1.2 million were added since October. In context, which is what we do here, the 23,000 people that crossed the channel this year is modest, behind the trend that was set last year and far behind the numbers arriving in southern Europe. Nonetheless, it is the British Home Secretary leading the charge for reform. She travelled to Washington today to call for a new way of looking at the UN Refugee Convention. She says the West needs a narrower definition of the term refugee and that convention, first signed in 1951, is in her idea out of date. Illegal migration is not merely an event-driven or cyclical problem. It's a permanent and structural challenge for the developed nations in general and the West in particular. Unless we act, it will only worsen in the years to come. War, political instability and climate change will of course exacerbate migration flows. According to the UN, at the end of 2022, there were over 108 million forcibly displaced people globally, with 29 million considered to be refugees by the UNHCR. But we must be honest. The fundamental drivers of this epoch-defining challenge are economics and demography. In January, the World Economic Forum said that migration will become one of the top five global risks in the next decade, ahead of national resource crisis, geoeconomic confrontation and environmental disasters. Well, before we get uh, some thoughts on this, let's quickly return to what the original convention says. It was drafted post-war in 1951, when, of course, millions of people in Europe had been forcibly displaced. It defined refugee status as someone unable or unwilling to return to their country of origin, owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion. It created in international law a minimum standard for the treatment of refugees, and it stipulated that refugees cannot be penalised for breaching immigration rules while fleeing. Almost 150 countries have signed up to that convention, and it is still considered the cornerstone of the international asylum system. Let's speak then to Dr. Shelvin. He's an immigration barrister and adjunct professor at Southampton Law School. Good to see you again. Do you accept the Home Secretary's broad premise that refugee, the Refugee Convention is out of date and now being misused? Well, I, I think, uh, fearing uh, as an immigration lawyer I was and all the rhetoric prior to her speech, I was expecting rivers of blood, but what I got was rivers of mud because it was a swab-like um, talk for over 30 minutes uh, where there was a, a, a lot of technical error in relation to the law. So, for example, you know, um, the Home Secretary referred to Article 1 of the 1951 Convention, and we know that that was amended by the 1967 Protocol and Article 1A2. She referred to all sorts of issues in relation to gay men and women and being able to claim asylum purely or get refugee status purely on that status, which were highly inaccurate or purely on the basis that you will face discrimination. So I was very concerned at the beginning that this was going to be a speech which will directly impact on the UK's approach to refugee cases when the majority of what she said, 90% was based on you know cultural norms regarding nationality and multiculturalism, and then only about 5% was on mm. refugee cases. So the vast majority of her speech was technically erroneous, and in, but the, the, the signpost, which was always there, is it's never about just stop the boats, it's stop about any refugee coming to the UK and claiming asylum through their own means and being afforded protection and sanctuary. Well, I've, so, I've sort of touched on the disparity between the figures coming here to the UK and, and those in other countries more sorely affected. But it is true, what she says, that cities and countries cannot grow exponentially and provide the services for tens of thousands of people arriving at once without without breaking the trust and the charity of people who do want to extend help to those genuinely at risk of persecution. And it is undeniable that mixed in with those asylum seekers, those genuine asylum seekers, 
are tens and tens of thousands of economic migrants. OK, that, um, the, the figures aren't supported by the facts. So, so let's break that down a bit, uh, Christian. The, the, the first uh, issues are related to that. Not everybody's arriving at mass. The UK government has created this problem. There are 175,000 refugees who claimed asylum who are waiting a decision on their asylum claims. Robert Jenrick, the immigration minister, only a few months ago said that his core priority was not to reduce the numbers waiting to get their refugee claims. That's why we've got the overbearing burden on our housing crisis in relation yeah. to... The but you're talking specifically about the UK and I'm talking about the macro debate, the oh, wider oh, oh. debate. I mean, it, I mean, it is undeniable. You've just had 11,000 arrive on Lampedusa where they have space for 400. There are 9,000 coming across every day across the Texan border. They have 1.2 million cases to be processed since October. Oh, yes. Uh, well, when we're looking at the global crisis, but when we look at the majority of refugees, and remember, the figures in relation to forcibly displaced people also include people who are internal relocations, so go to another part of their home country. But the majority of refugees, if you look at the focus of the majority of refugees, they're in sub-Saharan Africa and in neighbouring countries. So when we look at the numbers, they're not all coming in at once. Yes, we've got crisis points in relation to, to Mexico. We've got crisis points in relation to, to what's happening in, in, in Italy. And that's why the Euro European Union has gone in relation to this framework regarding sharing of refugees across the Union. And note that it is this Conservative government who opted out of the uh, European Union with Brexit to not be part of that agreement. So, so yeah, yes, on a global crisis, but we've got to get the proportional response and mm. focus that the majority of refugees are not going to Mexico, they're not going to the UK. You know, the, the Home Secretary talked about the fact that 780 million uh, are, are estimated who would want to come to the mm. UK. Well, mm. I want to win the lottery. That doesn't mean that I'm going to win the lottery. Mm. You know, we've got to really get a reality check on this. Is that what we've got to focus on is, on is getting resources. Now, take another contrasting view. You look at Japan, you look at Singapore, they've got birth rates which are basically nil. They don't have younger generations coming into uh, through the birth rates to be able to care for the elderly, to be able to pay for the care of the elderly. So migration is very much imperative in relation to first world nations and, and nations of the global north to ensure mm. that where, where there are failing birth rates, I, I was amazed at the Home Secretary talked about yeah. one in five are migrants, that we need to have birth rates in, in first world nations, otherwise we're not going to have the people to be able to look after our elderly and be able to grow our populations. Yeah, well that is, that is certainly true of a lot of Western countries where um, labour supply is under great strain at the moment. Stay there for me Dr Shelvin if you would because I want to bring in Anthony Zerka to get some reaction from the United States. I mean, one of the things she pointed to, Anthony Zerka, who's with me uh, in Washington, uh, one of the things she, she pinpointed was the inadequate integration of those arriving. How, how big a problem has that been in your home state of, of Texas, where they are currently streaming across the border? It's been a, a big problem in Texas, and it's been a problem that the Republican governor of Texas has tried to address, essentially by putting these migrants onto buses and sending them to major northern cities like New York City and Washington, D.C. Here, there's a processing center for Hondurans just down from the Washington Bureau of BBC News. And you can see people lined up around the block every day trying to get their immigration papers confirmed. And Chicago is another place, Los Angeles. So it's swamping the border towns. But what the Texas governor, Governor mm -hmm. Abbott, has, has been doing is picking them up and moving them elsewhere in the country, and that is creating a processing challenge, uh, even in places like New York that has declared a state of emergency because they're just, uh, their social services have been swamped by the number of undocumented migrants who have been arriving. Uh, reform on this issue, as, as we well know, Anthony, we've discussed it many times, has been elusive even at a national level. I mean, no one in Congress would dispute there's a crisis at the southern border, but if you can't even find reform at a national level, then what hope do you have among 150 nations that are signatories to this convention? I can definitely speak to, to being a, a challenge here in the United States. And part of that is because Republicans see the problem and their solution is increased border security, turning people back at the border and having a, a wall along the U.S.-Mexico border and having more draconian immigration policies. Uh, Democrats look at the exact same problem uh, and they see a, a problem of accommodation for these migrants who are coming across. They want to have a more humanitarian program and they're trying to control this immigration at the source in places like Venezuela and southern districts of, of Mexico and Central America that is creating this drive of people who are leaving their home countries 
because their life there is so bad that they're willing to risk the migration across through Mexico and into the United States, even without any kind of guarantee that they'll be given a home here. But that is the point, is it not, that the Home Secretary was making today, that these are not people necessarily at risk of persecution, although some of them may well be. This is, uh, this is a train of people who are coming f because of climate change, because their economic circumstances have changed dramatically, and because there is the promise of a much better life across the American border. And what she's saying is that there needs to be a change to the convention to recognise the reality of where we are 70-odd years on from the signing of the original convention. Right, I think she had an interesting line about the, the immigration policies uh, weren't crafted for an age of electronics and jet travel. But the reality is that most of the people who are coming across the United States border from Mexico. They're not coming in boats like in the UK. They're not coming on planes. They are coming on foot or hopping on trains. And there are a number of different reasons for this. I mean, what are the big drivers right now that has caused this upswing again in cross-border immigration uh, is Venezuela. And the situation, humanitarian, economic, political in Venezuela, is creating a hemispheric refugee crisis. It's a crisis that countries like Colombia are having to deal with, countries like Mexico are having to deal with, and now it is filling up onto the border of the United States. And you know, that's not a question uh, of reforming the policies. These people are willing to leave Venezuela no matter what just to get out of that country because their lives there are unsustainable. Yeah, I mean, maybe, Dr. Shelvin, it's, uh, it's reform of the way we deal with conflicts and refugee crises of, around the world that is, 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 is much more urgent at this point in time. But, I mean, the point is, as Anthony said, governments are taking things into their own hands with more draconian measures. Isn't there a risk that if you don't reform the convention, then simply countries opt out? Well, uh, I, I think that's for individual countries to, to decide. I mean, the problem with the proposals by the Home Secretary was that uh, she wants uh, a burden in relation to the refugee to claim asylum in the first what she says is a safe country. And the Convention does not say that Article 31 of the Convention in relation to criminal penalties is not in relation to uh, the method or journey of those individuals who claim asylum that, that's subjective. Um, so unfortunately, the, the, the detail it did have didn't actually stack up to what the realities are. So this was just a, a right-wing political talk to put on the scrapbook for political leadership. It had nothing really to do with actual uh, change. Uh, in relation to how the world treats refugees. How much, Anthony, do you think this becomes part of the debate next year in, in the general election? Is immigration at the top of the list of people's priorities? It's high up on the list, definitely, and it was back in 2016, if you'll recall as well. I mean, Donald Trump made immigration and building that border wall and stopping the number of migrants coming into the US a central theme in his presidential campaign that, that generated resentment, anger from his base that they felt like something was being deprived of them by this rise in immigration. And Donald Trump is running again. Donald Trump is probably going to be the nominee again. And uh, I think it's a, a guarantee that he will make immigration another central component uh, mm -hmm. of his presidential campaign. And Joe Biden, because of this uptake in migration that's happened during his uh, three years as president, he's going to have to answer for that. And that's going to be a criticism that he's going to have to respond to, because if you look at polls, it is an issue that Americans do care about. They see the pictures, they read the newspaper stories, they know what's going on, not only on the border, but also, as I mentioned, in these cities like New York and Chicago and Los Angeles that are having to deal with the crisis. Uh, Dr. Shelvin, you, you've picked out plenty of inconsistencies in her argument. The one, there was just one that I wanted to pick up on. She said, for instance, that being gay from a country that's outlawed homosexuality is now effectively enough to qualify for protection. I just had a look at that from the research I've looked at. Um, LGBT sexual orientation is cited in only 1% of asylum claims. So is she talking about something that's not actually a problem? Well, I, I think she needs to go back and, and read Asylum Law 101. I mean, it's 2% of claims from, from last year, but the Supreme Court made it quite clear that not only do you have to be gay, lesbian or bisexual, but you have to be from a country where openly gay people face a well-founded fear of persecution. Um, that's been the law for, you know, since we've been looking at refugee claims and then the discretion test. So to say things like just being gay or just being a woman or being from a country where uh, you may face discrimination is not a point I'm familiar with. I think that's the kindest way to put it in relation to the law on refugee status.
Dr. Chauvin, always good to get your expertise. Anthony Zerke in the United States, thank you very much uh, to you as well. Thank you.